I think the importance is uh, that a small group of Navy people had the vision to see that uh, exploring all corners of the world ocean, if you will, was pretty important uh, for naval operations and perhaps enhancing the submarine force. And uh, we were all submarine types the, on the military side. And this was an extension of uh, uh, submarine operations, if you will. It's not really a submarine, of course, but the closest job description you could get in the Navy was uh, for bathyscaphe pilot or submersible pilot was submarine qualification. Uh, there were only two of these things in the world at the time. So if you, if you look back, again, aviation history, uh, it's like when Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers had, there were two airplanes in the world and, and uh, you, know, you take turns flying them. Uh, they, uh, it was just the very beginning. So everything on this uh, had to be designed by us and made by us because there were any commercial vendors, no catalog that sold parts that were qualified for 20, 000, uh, 16,000 PSI, eight tons per square inch pressure and to do the things you want to do. Cameras, lights, samplers, uh, sensors, uh, instrument sensors, all that we had to design and build or have built. And so we were writing the book for uh, deep ocean operations uh, because the trenches in the world ocean only are 2% of the total area of the seafloor. If you can dive to 20,000 feet, you can see 98% of the seafloor. We're going to 36,000 feet in this thing. so. It was really uh, mare incognita, the unknown sea down there. And uh, but what's the knock-on effect? Well, when I go to trade shows today, 60 years later, and I look at these uh, vehicles, of course, those days we didn't have unmanned, like the underwater drones, uh, or tethered ones like the remotely operated vehicles. And manned vehicle was the only thing we had. Why? Because it was easier to put a person in something like this to do the job then we could use robotics of the time, you know, vacuum tubes and uh, not very good batteries or batteries that took up so much space there's no room for the people and so it's all very primitive and the most reliable thing you stuff in this thing was to humans because of the human brain you know, it's a pretty good computer. So that uh, today you've got lots of choices and in fact I'd, I'd maintain that the uh, heavy lifting for deep ocean exploration in out your future years from now will be unmanned systems because robotics and the, the advent of AI moving very quickly and capability of these things will always be room for a person, a, a people there that'll be just on the on the fringe of deep ocean exploration because the vehicles are so reliable today, so productive, low cost. And if something goes wrong, you don't have to write a letter to the widow, you know. So. It's, uh, there's a lot to be said for it. I don't want to talk against my own experience, but you know, that was six decades ago. Six decades before I made this dive, they didn't have the first airplane. That gives you an idea of the spatial distance between where you started and what's going on today. I get asked a lot by people, uh, well, Dr. Walsh, what's, what's different from a nuclear submarine? And I said, that's like standing Wilbur Wright in front of a 747 and saying, well, the difference between your airplane and this one. But when I go to the trade shows, coming back to my thought, I can see our fingerprints, our DNA on everything that where we first started. Underwater manipulators, mechanical arms and hands, the cameras, the lights that we developed, the things we needed to make this an efficient uh, oceanographic or scientific platform. Uh, and that gives me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, you talk to young people in the trade show on the, you know, on the stands and some kind of whiz bang underwater vehicle and, and you tell them, well, I used to do this sort of thing a few years ago and their eyes kind of glaze over. So the young ones aren't very interested. So that comes back then to uh, a question you asked a moment ago and that is, what's the knock on effect? What's the important thing the Navy and to, let's say, studies the ocean as a whole. We were the first of this kind of work, in situ we call it, that is, taking the trained eye and the trained mind to the workplace, not sitting on top on a ship where you can't see under the water, that opaque barrier. Uh, you actually go into it. The first way we got to do that was in the late 50s, actually contemporary with when we started, and that was SCUBA, that a, you know, a Scripps Institution or University of Washington, Texas A&M, for a few hundred dollars could buy uh, diving equipment, train 
a PhD scientist, an oceanographer, to do his own work in situ. Low cost, but of course limited, because you're only looking at about a sort of a hundred foot maximum working depth and uh, for an ordinary scuba diver. So that's, that's what we did in being able to lead people into the, the ocean depths. It was not for record setting.